Messing with the past may be irresponsible, but The Flash gets a lot of mileage out of reviving past versions of Batman. Here are all the small details The Flash hid across its scattered timelines. At the beginning of The Flash, Barry Allen is waiting in line for a custom breakfast sandwich when he gets a call from Alfred Pennyworth. Chaos has broken out in Gotham City, and Batman needs The Flash. Starving and already late for work, the ever-complaining speedster asks if Superman might be able to lend a hand instead. However, as both Alfred and a TV broadcast tell him, Kal-El is busy fighting… a volcano? While not quite overt, this moment can be read as a reference to one of Superman's first cinematic outings. In the early 1940s, Fleischer Studios produced a series of animated shorts starring the Man of Steel. One of these, simply entitled Volcano, has Superman saving people from the eruption of… well, you guessed it. Given how many past incarnation of soups are directly referenced later in the film, this feels too spot on to be a coincidence. It's just a shame that fans couldn't catch a glimpse of Henry Cavill one last time. Michael Keaton fans aren't the only ones treated to some proper Batman action in The Flash. The opening set piece in Gotham sees the Dark Knight chasing down a gang of two-bit crooks who have stolen a dangerous pathogen. It's the kind of classic broad daylight chase that Batfleck never really got to do in his previous movies, and it evokes the Christian Bale Batman movies in more ways than one. First and foremost, there's Bruce Wayne's heavy-duty bat cycle, which bears a striking resemblance to the one Bale's character drives in The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises. You can't be. Boy, you are in for a show tonight, son. But of course, the bat cycle didn't start with Christopher Nolan. There have been numerous incarnations of Batman's motorcycle in the comics dating back to the 1950s. Even Robert Pattinson's caped crusader rides one in The Batman, albeit one that actually fits with his Bruce Wayne alter ego. It's also worth noting that the criminals Batman is chasing in this sequence are led by another comic book character. The credits name their leader as Al Falcone, which is likely short for Alberto Falcone. In the comics, the villainous Alberto is the son of notorious Gotham crime lord Carmine Falcone, last portrayed in live action by John Turturro in The Batman. Though the name is never used, and the device itself is never constructed, Barry's method of traveling back through time in The Flash evokes the cosmic treadmill. One of the character's primary methods of time travel in the comics, the treadmill was powered by cosmic energy and designed to make jumping into the past and future easy. In The Flash TV show, a different version of the treadmill appears, playing a role in a number of Arrowverse events. The movie doesn't employ an actual treadmill, but the visual effect of Barry's time travel seems intended to reference it. Once he starts running fast enough, he enters what the films refer to as the Chrono Bowl, which lays out temporal events in 360 degrees around him. Once there, he runs in place at varying speeds to either go forward or backward in time, thus causing the surrounding events to expand outward or collapse into him. The mechanic of running in place is sure to make comic or Arrowverse fans think of the cosmic treadmill, even though the actual action is different. One of the most interesting tidbits dropped in The Flash occurs in a brief exchange between Barry and Bruce. After Barry realizes that he can enter the Chrono Bowl and go back in time, Bruce tells him not to mess with the past, as doing so could unravel the very fabric of reality. It still would be wildly irresponsible. I knew you were going to say that. Barry counters by referencing the last time he managed to change time in Pizarnov, the Russian city from Justice League. Here's the thing, though. Barry's one-second jump into the past at Pizarnov only occurs in the Snyder Cut of the Justice League, not the original film. Joss Whedon's version has Superman step in and defeat Steppenwolf before he can activate the Mother Boxes. But in Zack Snyder's version, the villain wins, forcing the Flash to run back in time and prevent it from happening. By having Barry and Bruce reference this event, The Flash seems to make the Snyder Cut version of the story canon. Larger implications of that would be the continued existence of Darkseid, the Green Lantern Corps, and Martian Manhunter's partnership with Batman. Since the new DCU is effectively rewriting the whole movie timeline, these revelations probably won't have any resounding impact. Still, it's curious to see the franchise give canonical credence to the film's infamous director's cut. If you thought that Warner Brothers would be content simply to reference its other DC properties in The Flash, think again. At times, the movie becomes a veritable space jam a new legacy of shoehorn nods to other WB brands. Barry Allen's bedroom in the Flashpoint timeline is covered with movie posters for other Warner Brothers films, including Pacific Rim, V for Vendetta, and Inception. His apartment is similarly adorned, featuring a Mars Attacks poster and a computer monitor wallpaper of both Mortal Kombat and Looney Tunes. Crazy how everything Barry loves was produced or distributed by WB, isn't it? One of the key differences in the Flashpoint timeline that shows Barry just how different things are concerns Back to the Future. 
In the new reality that Barry creates, Eric Stoltz plays Marty McFly in the movie instead of Michael J. Fox. If you're familiar with the film, you'll know that Stoltz was indeed cast in the leading role before Fox was brought on. In fact, production began with Stoltz starring and continued for a number of weeks. Eventually, he was fired because his acting style was deemed too serious and Fox was brought in to replace him. When the original Barry mentions Fox to his doppelganger and his roommates, they say that Fox actually appeared in Footloose while Kevin Bacon starred in Top Gun. General Zod is back. Just like in Man of Steel, he invades Earth with his Kryptonian forces in search of a rebel expat. Only this time, that target ends up being Kara Zor-El instead of Superman. With Zod come a bunch of other specifics from the Zack Snyder film. The creepy, staticky announcement video that he broadcasts to the world is the same one seen in Man of Steel, as is his ship, his power suit, and the gear of his forces. This world must die. One less overt but certainly curious detail is the use of a snap zoom in one shot of Zod and Kara's battle. The cinematic technique is prevalent in Man of Steel to the point of being downright distracting, and the only instance of it in the Flash occurs during the duel with Zod. When Barry Allen arrives in the new timeline he's created and discovers that no one is stepping up to face Zod, he tries to find the rest of the Justice League. That proves more difficult than he planned, however, as most of the heroes simply aren't around. Tamora Morrison makes a cameo as Thomas Curry, reprising his role from Aquaman, but his son Arthur was never born in the new universe. Barry looks up Victor Stone, aka Cyborg, but he discovers that his friend is still a star football player. This alludes to the promising career detailed in Zack Snyder's Justice League, which was cut short by the injuries that led to Victor's cyborg rebirth. Without that tragedy, he never becomes a superhero. Booyah. The absence of Wonder Woman can be simply explained, though it's brushed over in the film. Since Barry's time travel also affects the past, it probably changed things so that Steve Trevor never crash-landed on Themyscira, thereby ensuring that the Amazons remained hidden from the rest of the world. The one Justice League member Barry and Barry are able to track down is Batman, but not Ben Affleck's version. Instead, they infiltrate Wayne Manor to find Michael Keaton's incarnation of the character living in peaceful solitude and cooking spaghetti. It seems that he never hired more help to keep up the property after Alfred passed away, which makes some sense given their bond. And with Gotham now one of the safest cities in the world, according to him, he seems to have no real calling in life anymore. Of course, he still has the Batcave, which proves to be a treasure trove of Easter eggs for fans of Keaton's Batman movies. When the two Flashes first enter the secret lair, they're greeted by a refrain of Danny Elfman's iconic theme music from the 1989 film. And then they discover the Batmobile, still arguably the most famous version of the car, right where you remember it resting. Later on, the younger Barry discovers a more obscure item, a retro laughing bag prank toy. Those who have seen Keaton's Batman face off against Jack Nicholson's Joker will know that this tool provided the villain's last laugh. You dropped me into that vat of chemicals. That wasn't easy to get over. Don't think that I didn't try. After falling to his death during the 1989 film's climax, Joker's body still laughs. At least, that's what appears to be happening before the police retrieve the bag from his pocket. The flash indicates that Bruce held onto this trinket either as a trophy or as a grim remembrance. Michael Keaton's Batman has a lot of gadgets, gizmos, and quick lines that pay tribute to his glory days. We see Bruce open up a secret closet hidden in a bookcase that houses a variety of bat suits. The central one is what he ends up wearing for the rest of the movie, but viewers can also see his suits from Batman and Batman Returns, one that resembles Adam West's costume from the old Batman TV show, and another with the classic gray suit blue cape scheme of the comics, among others. Once the rescue mission kicks off, we see the older Dark Knight's tools in action. Grapple guns and batarangs still get the job done, and Keaton's fight scenes are choreographed in a flashy martial arts style, right down to the perfectly emphasized punching sound effects. The caped crusader also gets to drop some of his most famous lines, including... I'm Batman. You wanna get nuts? Let's get nuts. The Kryptonian rescue saga in The Flash takes its outline from the Flashpoint comics event, but its aesthetic from Superman Red Sun. In the former, Kal-El is captured and imprisoned by a secret US government organization after crash landing in Metropolis as a baby. Brutally experimented upon in a bunker far away from the sun, he's eventually rescued by the team of Batman, Flash, and Cyborg. It's easy to imagine how the scene would have played out in the movie had Ray Fisher not been ousted from the project. As it stands, the second Barry takes Cyborg's place. There are two big differences in the movie version, however. The first and most obvious one is that it's Kara zor and not Kal-El who's imprisoned and rescued. The other difference is that she's trapped in a Russian mercenary facility instead of a US government lab. 
this shift in political geography could be seen as a reference to Red Sun, the acclaimed Superman storyline that imagines him landing in the Soviet Union instead of America. The ending of The Flash features a massive battle between the US military, Zod's forces, and a hodgepodge Justice League consisting of Batman, Kara, and two Flashes. We see that fight numerous times as the two Barrys run back the clock to try to get a win. It doesn't work, but their efforts pull hard on the fabric of space-time, yanking in a variety of other chronobles from parallel realities. That's when the Easter eggs really ramp up. The first universe features a black-and-white Superman, playing tribute to late star George Reeves and his Adventures of Superman TV series from the 1950s. At the center of this chronobole is Jay Garrick, played by Teddy Sears. He's the original Flash, and he even has his winged hat. Sears previously portrayed a version of Garrick in the Arrow vs. Flash show, though that character wasn't exactly the true Jay. Another world features Christopher Reeve's Superman from the 1970s and 80s movies, who appears alongside Helen Slater's Supergirl from the 1984 film of the same name. Even Adam West's Batman makes a cameo, popping in from his beloved retro TV world. You may return to your business, citizen. The biggest surprise in the big space-time climax of The Flash is the appearance of Nicolas Cage's Superman, who was meant to appear in the late 90s film Superman Lives, but neither the character nor the film ever made it to the big screen. Tim Burton was set to direct the picture, and extensive pre-production work was done, but the project eventually fizzled out. Cage's look in The Flash is true to how the character would have looked in the cancelled film. The scene in which Cage's Superman appears is also a tribute to the unfilmed script, which reportedly would have featured a fight between Kal-El and a giant spider. That's exactly what the character is seen fighting in The Flash. It's very silly, but also quite fun and a nice nod to one of the biggest superhero movies we never wound up getting. The ultimate villain of The Flash ends up being Barry Allen himself. Yes, the freaky purple monster that knocks him out of the Chronobole near the beginning is in fact an aged version of Barry driven mad through ages of trying to save his timeline. This warped version of the character doesn't get a new name in the film, but he's evocative of a few different incarnations from other Flash stories. The closest point of comparison would probably be the version of the Flash in Robert Venditti and Ben Jensen's Out of Time comics arc, with art by Brett Booth and Ron Frenz. In that storyline, a version of Barry from the future attempts to right a series of perceived wrongs through the past, but he only ends up causing more chaos in the Speed Force and the timeline. Fans more familiar with the CW's Flash series might have thought of the villain Savitar, who's revealed to be a future version of Barry Gone Bad. Who are you? Savitar, the god of speed. Savitar's monstrous form in the show is reminiscent in some ways of the purple Barry in the movie, but the two are admittedly quite different in their backstories. It's also worth noting that Savitar isn't actually Barry in the comics, so it's possible that the new film took direct inspiration from the Arrowverse. When Barry finally gets back to his original timeline, everything seems to be set right. A slight tweak in the course of events allows his imprisoned father to be exonerated, but other than that, things are just as they were. At least until Bruce Wayne shows up to congratulate Barry on the victory in court. It isn't Ben Affleck's Batman. It isn't Michael Keaton's Batman. It isn't even Robert Pattinson's Batman. No, instead, The Flash pulls a fast one via a cameo from Batman and Robin star and cinema legend George Clooney. The 1997 film is widely considered one of the worst superhero flicks of all time. The gap in time between it and 2005's Batman Begins has been blamed directly on its poor reception. But over the years, the film has taken on an almost cult-like status for its hilarious writing and campy style. Six million. Seven million. <laughs> Never leave the cave without it. With all that history in mind, it's fun to see Clooney back in the role of Bruce Wayne, and it helps that he's still a huge movie star who oozes charm and charisma basically everywhere he goes. You know, like Bruce Wayne. So maybe Clooney wasn't such a bizarre casting choice after all.